Someone took the screen away, so with the phone number. I'm working on it now. One second, please. All right, Brandy, um, take it away. And um, Mark, I'm just going to reach out to you verbally. Uh, message me when you want me to bring up the moral resili resilience round slide. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started, Brandy. Great. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mark Hughes, I co-chair the uh, Ethics Committee with Cinda Rushton. Uh, welcome to Ethics for Lunch. Um, many of you may have participated in the past, uh, so thank you for joining us via Zoom. Um, have another interesting uh, panel discussion today. And um, want to uh, let you know that we do offer CME. We didn't offer it last month, but do have the capability of doing it this month. Uh, if you uh, look uh, here at the uh, screenshot, uh, if you text 443-541-5052, uh, then this code 22264, uh, that will register with the CME office and be able to get you uh, the CME credits. Um, and we hope to offer that in, in June as well. So uh, as a reminder, we're always uh, the third uh, Tuesday of every month uh, from noon to 1 p.m. So uh, look forward to seeing you in the future as well. Going to uh, just show you uh, one other uh, thing that we're offering uh, through the Berman Institute and the Ethics Committee. Uh, Suzanne will uh, show this slide about moral resilience rounds. For the uh, clinicians in the uh, group uh, that are joining us today, uh, on Thursdays, uh, also at noon, uh, we offer an opportunity for the community of clinicians, uh, our, our frontline workers uh, who are dealing with the pandemic uh, to come together and uh, uh, talk uh, with each other, share uh, their um, experiences uh, in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, so we invite you to that session as well. Uh, for today, I'm going to turn it over to Brandy Scully, uh, who will moderate our session and uh, introduce our panelists. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hughes. So um, I'm Brandy. I'm one of the um, postdoctoral fellows, Heck Levy fellows at the Berman Institute. I'm also one of the cardiothoracic surgery fellows here at Hopkins. Really appreciate the panels. Uh, we have Dr. Whitman, who is the head of our CVSICU. Um, a cardiothoracic surgeon and intensivist. Uh, we have um, Dr. Kim, who's one of our critical care physicians in the COVID unit. Dr. Bush, who is the head of our, um, ECMO, or our thoracic transplant program and um, in charge of venovenous ECMO uh, initiation. We have Caitlin Florin, one of our amazing ICU nurses, and then Dr. Turnbull um, from the ethics um, uh, side of things. So I was just briefly going to um, give a short historical perspective on ECMO. Um, so, and I know a lot of people here will know this, but ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's also referred to as extracorporeal life support. It was first used in the mid 1970s, but a large percentage of the patients utilizing ECMO were largely neonates and infants for the next several decades. And it really is a very resource intensive um, technology with hospitals having limited ECMO circuits and personnel with the expertise to manage patients on ECMO. So the role of ECMO is to take over for injured lungs and for patients in acute respiratory distress syndrome for whom ventilator support is inadequate. ECMO is a further step in support and when on ECMO, the patient's tissue oxygen delivery and carbon dioxide removal are managed via the circuit. And an, an interesting historic perspective is the interest in use of ECMO in adults really grew during the H1N1 influenza pandemic, which occurred just over a decade ago. So we find ourselves in the midst of another pandemic, um, but as our authors Ramanathan note in the Lancet reference, um, unlike in 2009, this outbreak is occurring at a time when the worldwide ECMO infrastructure and resources for education and re research are considerably more evolved and organized. So I did include um, both the NIH treatment guidelines, which note that there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against the routine use of ECMO for patients with COVID-19 and refractory hypoxemia. Um, but the WHO interim guidelines recommend administering venovenous ECMO 
to eligible patients with COVID-19 related acute respiratory distress syndrome in centers with sufficient case volumes to ensure clinical expertise. So with that, I'll just read the case statement and we can get started. Um, and then Dr. Whitman, would you mind just um, stating your disclosure here at the beginning of the conference? Can you do that? You're still muted, Dr. Whitman. I'm still muted. No, no you're not. Um, Cytos Cytosorb, the company Cytosorb is a, makes a, a, a resin that, by, that fits into a cardiopulmonary bypass circuit, even an ECMO circuit, um, that binds resins that um, promote inflammation. And uh, they're running a trial in the United States. It's used in Europe. They're running a trial in the United States uh, to, to prove that it is beneficial or at least not harmful. And I'm on the data safety monitoring board that oversees that trial to assure that no harm is being done to patients who receive it. Great. Um, and I apologize, I do not have slides. So I, I will just read our case statement here. Um, so Mr. G is a 35 year old male with past medical history of prediabetes and obesity. Um, I can share my screen though, Suzanne, if that would be helpful for people to see the, the words here. Would that be sure. Good? Yeah, that's fine. No problem. Okay, here we go. Oh, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay, let me take care of that for you. All right, can you try it again? There we go. So Mr. G is a 35 year old male, past medical history of prediabetes and obesity. He presented to an outside hospital with refractory respiratory failure secondary to COVID-19 requiring intubation. He was transferred to the Johns Hopkins Hospital MICU two days later for management of severe ARDS that had failed conventional therapy. And there he was prone, paralyzed, and managed on low tidal volume lung protective ventilation. In spite of this, he continued to have refractory respiratory acidosis and elevated plateau pressures. So a multidisciplinary Hopkins access line consult was obtained to consider initiation of ECMO. The patient was deemed to be a candidate for venovenous ECMO. A phone conversation was held with his family. Given his mechanical ventilation and paralysis, he was not able to participate in the discussion. The healthcare team recommended initiation of ECMO as a rescue therapy and to minimize further lung injury. After discussion of the risks and benefits of treatment, the family agreed to ECMO. He was transported to the CCU and placed on venovenous ECMO at bedside via the right internal jugular and right femoral veins. After 12 days, he was able to be weaned and decannulated from vena venous ECMO. He continued to have delirium and agitation requiring significant amounts of sedation, but was slowly improving. After requiring mechanical ventilation for over 14 days, a tracheostomy tube was placed bedside. His acute kidney injury gra gradually improved and 20 days after his initial presentation, he remains intubated and in the intensive care setting. So I think we'll start off um, by asking doctors Bush, Kim, and Whitman to discuss the things that they are thinking about when they get that HAL line call, the Hopkins access line call, and what they think should be considered and what should not. And I'm asking them also to reflect on if any of this has changed in the COVID-19 era. So Dr. Whitman, would you like to go first? Yeah, the way I'm going to go first is I'm going to say Bo Kim is usually on the phone and he hears this and then his medical expertise um, helps me and Errol um, in formulating a VV ECMO plan. So Bo, what do you think of this? So the first thing that we consider is that there 
becoming refractory to conventional modes of um, mechanical ventilation support. Of course, the patient has ARDS, the patient has respiratory failure, but there's obviously very, uh, a large spectrum of, of severity uh, at presentation. And so we really want to see them, uh, if, if they're failing conventional modes of ventilation, uh, we would see, we would ask the providers to uh, demonstrate that all interventions have not worked. And that includes proning, that includes inhaled nitric oxide, uh, usually the use of neuromuscular blocking agents, uh, and also lung protective settings, the ARDS protocols uh, are usually followed. Uh, and lastly, we do ask uh, a, a kind of an unconventional vent, vent mode that uh, oftentimes people, uh, patients do respond to, but that's a little bit controversial. But that's really kind of the first step is, is determining that uh, they are at the end stage of, of what we can provide and that they're refractory. Uh, there are specific guidelines as far as P to F ratio, that's PaO2 divided by the FiO2, and the ratio has to be less than 80 for six hours, less than 50 for three hours. But these are kind of study guidelines from the EOLIA trial and ELSO guidelines. We don't follow it to the number. It's much more important for us to determine the trajectory of the patient. So if they're uh, certainly decompensating, we're not gonna wait six hours for them to demonstrate a P2F ratio less than, less than 80. Um, but if they're demonstrating that they are actually getting worse and worse on the current vent settings, or if they need uh, protection because their lungs are becoming injured, or, or they have a kind of a, a difficult to manage Hyper, hypercapnia with respiratory acidosis, that'd be another indication. But really, uh, are they sick enough and, and failing all no, normal modes of ventilation? And then, um, and then we, we go on to looking at the, the exclusions. And uh, I will uh, ask Errol to comment on the, on the exclusions that we generally look at. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bo. I agree with uh, everything that you've said. I think um, from a surgical perspective, thinking initially whether or not um, the patient is a candidate for all the reasons you just mentioned um, in terms of indications for therapy, but then start thinking about exclusions that would make a patient not, um, not safe to cannulate for ECMO, whether it's um, their, their physical location, it could be in an ICU, but they're unstable to transfer. Uh, port or transfer to an operating room um, or being in an outside hospital where um, it's not safe to transport that patient without having ECMO instituted uh, beforehand. Um, and then the second um, part of those exclusions would be, um, is it a person who we think would have a reasonable success or reasonable chance at, um, at um, being able to be weaned from the circuit? So if they don't have any um, pre-existing uh, lung disease or any other medical um, comorbidities that uh, would make it um, hard for them to recover from such a such a um, an acute uh, incident, um, and then um, <clears throat> and then will we be able to wean them off of ECMO to have a um, to have a, a quality of life that they um, would have expected? Um, I saw one of the uh, one of the panelists questions about, um, or sorry, one of the chat questions about um, the conversation that we have with patients beforehand, and um, I think that's a very big part of um, deciding um, on ECMO. If uh, if someone's a candidate, most of the times these patients are uh, so sick that um, that they don't have the opportunity to interact with the ECMO. Um, with the ECMO team, and so we oftentimes have to defer to the patient's uh, family or relatives um, in terms of um, if they have an understanding of uh, pre-existing uh, desires or wishes in terms of uh, aggressiveness of care. And I think um, usually many times the families are kind of caught in this situation where they don't have a great understanding and they also don't really understand what ECMO really means. And so we try to present a picture, at least in my discussions with, with family members, about um, how heroic uh, ECMO is, that it's not offered everywhere. In many instances, it's also not a proven therapy, um, but we're trying to select patients based on our, our predefined criteria that we think might have a chance to recover um, from it. So. 
So, you know, I wanted to ask the panel to reflect on the use of hospital resources um, for this patient population um, and how the healthcare team has balanced caring for these patients um, in this uncharted setting. I'm also hoping Dr. Whitman can comment on the statewide guidelines that he's been developing. So maybe Dr. Whitman, you could start. Um, the circuit, which looks like a miniature bypass uh, circuit, is made up of a tube taking blood out of the patient and another tube putting blood back into the patient. It goes through a pump that's, that spins and basically flings the blood through it. Uh, it. It gives it a centripetal force, sending it through an oxygenator and then back into the patient oxygenated. And that circuit costs around $2,000. And in general, it doesn't have to be changed during the patient's uh, ECMO run. The nurse required to care for that patient needs some ECMO experience. You can't just take a, a nurse off the street and say, take care of this ECMO patient. So it requires an experienced nurse. Um, and in general, the nurse is one-to-one. -one. Uh, and then it requires uh, oversight by uh, practitioners who have experience with ECMO. It's possible to really do it incorrectly and, and have it be of no benefit, uh, but knowing what you're doing uh, allows you to troubleshoot it and, and, and making it as effective as possible. You know, when, I, when one hears that uh, it's of unproven benefit, Um, it becomes a little bit of a religious issue, but only that is some of us believe in it and some of us don't. But when you have a viable human being and the only thing that's not working are his lungs, and you have a, this technical capability of giving his lungs more time to, to recover simply by putting him or her on a machine, it is almost impossible to look at the patient and say, you know, it's not proven that we're not gonna do it at this hospital because it's not proven therapy. Point one. Point two, there is a recent randomized clinical trial that uh, looked at ARDS um, in a select group of patients and randomized them. And, and the, the outcome of that was roughly 65% of patients survived with ECMO, 55% of patients survived without ECMO. The p-value was on the order of 0.1 with 125 people in each group. And furthermore, the people that got randomized to medicine, 25% of them switched over to ECMO. So being initially randomized to medicine, medical therapy, didn't exclude you if you got into real trouble from going over into the ECMO group. So these were the sickest of the sick going into the ECMO group. They could have contaminated it and made it worse, but even still, the numbers were that the ECMO group did better than the, no, that the, the absolute value of the survival was better than the medical group, but not statistically so. There are people who look at this study both ways, that um, ECMO still isn't proven therapy. There, there are people who look at it like, I think Errol and I and Bo look at it and say, when you're in extremis, yes, ECMO absolutely deserves, a, 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 um, deserves being used as therapy. Caitlin, could I have you comment on what being a bedside nurse taking care of an ECMO patient looks like during that 12 hour shift, just to give people an idea of how involved it can be? Sure. Um, like Dr. Whitman mentioned, when a nurse is caring for an ECMO patient, you know, it requires us to have special training. So um, not any nurse in the hospital can take care of the ECMO patients. Um, only a few ICUs have trained nurses. Um, and it also is, you know, one to one assignment. So it does take extra resources um, as opposed to other ICU patients that might be a one to two 
assignment, the nurse is one-to-one. -one. And, you know, like you said, our shifts are 12 hours. Um, and especially, you know, on the COVID ICUs, when you're kind of in the room and the PAPR all day with these ECMO patients, um, you know, it takes a lot of resources as far as, um, you know, the resources in the unit, gauze and lines and all that kind of stuff. And also, um, you know, nursing resources and pulling nurses to the, the COVID ICU that could be elsewhere. Thank you so much. We have uh, David asking about what is considered when we're accepting these patients for transfer. This, these transfer calls are also um, a big part of the group's work during the day. And I'm wondering if maybe um, Dr. Kim or Dr. Bush could comment on um, taking those transfer calls. Uh, David is asking um, what considerations are thought of in accepting patients for transfer? Um, are they part of any research protocols? And what, what survival are we quoting patients and their families, Dr. Whitman, you might wanna comment on that too. And do we use any risk scores to assess suitability? I, I can start. Um, I think when we get called about uh, patients from the outside hospitals, uh, you know, the, the selection criteria is very, Pretty much the same and we would still consider whether the patient was eligible for ECMO and, and because it's resource intensive I think uh, patient selection is, is extremely important and uh, you know and if the patient has any exclusion criteria then we let the, the hospital know that they would not be accepted. Now if the patient was, uh, was acceptable there was no exclusions but we weren't 100% sure how sick the patient was meaning they may still have some room to maneuver on the ventilator or they had some other uh, interventions that had, they haven't tried. Uh, we will ask them to now, of course, given that we have the room to accept patients, uh, we will ask them to transfer over and, and we'll try to optimize the patient and see if they really truly need ECMO. Uh, and, and the best case scenario is, you know, they start doing better uh, in our MICU or, or in our other units and they don't actually need to get cannulated. Um, but in the event that they do, uh, then they would still have to meet all of our criteria. Now, Ben is asking, how do you think about ECMO triage in the event there are not enough machines for all who might benefit? What different considerations are there for ECMO triage than ventilator triage? And I just wanted to add to that for comment that in the ELSO guidance document on this, they note that younger patients with minor and no comorbidities are the highest priority while resources are limited, healthcare workers are a high priority and it should be acknowledged that this is a dynamic prioritization. Do you have any thoughts on that, Dr. Whitman? Dr. Yes. yes. Point, point one, the elso.org uh, website in the COVID-19 era shows the following. Um, ELSO.org is an organization to which uh, a lot of us belong. There are probably 200 or so pay, uh, hospitals in the United States that, are, that do ECMO. By the way, there are 6,000 hospitals in the United States that have intensive care units. There are, as I just said, 200 of them that are capable of putting people on, on ECMO um, and caring for them. Hospitals can put people in ECMO, but then they can tra they'll transfer them out because they're not capable of, of having personnel that can care for them. Now, if you play to put a person on, on ECMO and you want to participate in the international database that is run by ELSO, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization uh, uh, website that allows you to, part to share information, you can see right now that there are 909, um, there are 900 patients who have, who are COVID-19 positive, who have been entered into the ELSO database um, as having been put on ECMO, point one. 329 of those 900 patients have ended up, um, no long, are no longer on the ECMO circuit and half of them have been discharged. The other half are either not yet discharged or have died. 
And then, as I said, there's still 600 more who are still on ECMO. So when one looks at survival, I think one right now is, is most of us think if you get to the point where one of these 200 hospitals that enters data into also think you deserve, you, you deserve ECMO, you got a 50% chance of dying. I think that's the way we think about it. The, the second issue is that yes, healthcare workers are important and young people are important, but there are guidelines for who does poorly and who does well. And, and there are scores for who's gonna do poorly and who does well. But if you have a person who, who basically fits into the acceptability range, and let's just pretend it's a 58 year old with diabetes um, who's had a previous MI, but otherwise is a, healthy, is a healthy human being who's been an active participant in life, and you get called to, that this person needs to be put on ECMO, you don't say to yourself, well, you know, he's a, he's a, a marginal candidate and I, there might be a young guy coming around the corner. Uh, I'm gonna save the bed for the young guy who might be coming around the corner. I'm not gonna put that guy on ECMO. That's not what we do. We put him on ECMO. Why? Because we believe he's gonna die if he doesn't go on ECMO and he's got a real survival possibility on ECMO whether it's 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% chance by these scores, it, it, it doesn't matter. If that bed's available and this person's going to die without ECMO, he gets ECMO. Then you run into the possibility that you're going to use up all of your ECMO beds and you're going to have someone on ECMO who has less chance of, of a survival than someone who needs ECMO, but who has a better chance of survival. And that's its own dilemma. Errol, did you want to add anything to what I just said? Would you add something to what I just said? Because you do this all the time. You handle these calls. I know. I think you um, um, you said a lot to um, to answer the question. Um, I think in the around the time of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic spreading, um, but before we had. Um, experienced our first ECMO consultation. Uh, we sat down in a multidisciplinary fashion and tried to establish criteria for um, going on ECMO, um, which actually was pretty similar to what we had pre-COVID, but also what we would do in the, in the case if we had um, an extremely or critical supply of ECMO circuits. And so um, we actually came up with the way usually we have um, approximately five ECMO circuits available to us before, um, ec um, before COVID. And we were able to um, come up with a way that if we needed to, we could come up with 20, uh, 20 ECMO circuits that would uh, run the usual way and that we could, um, in theory, care for, the, care for those patients as needed. Um, what, we, what we found uh, more recently is that uh, we're not necessarily limited by the ECMO circuits as we thought we would be. Uh, we're more... Um, limited by hospital capacity, which is affected by um, bed space and personnel, whether there's nursing and faculty and, and all those other things. So the, the circuit limitation is not necessarily um, one that, um, that we've had to deal with. But having said that, in our contingency plan, we did come up with a way, and this also works with the, the hospital's ventilator policy of what happens when you get down to a critical number of ventilators and what um, you're supposed to do. And so with both ECMO and ventilators, there's a, um, there's a proposed uh, triage team that would, um, that would be activated when there's a critical number. And uh, that team um, would have the responsibility of determining whether or not um, 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 the last utilization of those resources should occur. So should someone go on ECMO or if there's um, someone who's not doing well um, with an ECMO and has been on for a long time is not going to survive, they would have the responsibility of, um, of potentially um, having that person come off so that someone would be able to go on. Um, so that's kind of the way that the system um, is proposed. Um, we haven't had to test how that would work. And obviously if someone is um, selected that would need to come off 
um, or that is selected to come off of ECMO, um, then that person or their representatives would have uh, an opportunity to appeal to a different team um, for, uh, for that person to not be removed. Um, Dr. Kim, do you wanna elaborate on how we use those ECMO precannulation scores when we're having these discussions? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I know that, that uh, there was a question about score, the precannulation scores, and there is uh, preserve and RESP, R-E-S-P scores that you can actually use, and they're online. You can use uh, MD Calc on it, but uh, we don't generally go to those sites or, or use the scores themselves uh, to the letter, uh, because basically when we ask our exclusion criteria, uh, we are really pretty much hitting all the items on these scores you know, BMI less than 40, age less than 60, uh, being on the mechanical ventilator less than seven days, so on and so forth. So uh, we do use the scores, but kind of indirectly. I mean, we, we have our exclusions that are based on uh, which patients will, would have the best chance of survival on ECMO. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I wanted to bring up for me personally and the fellows um, that are participating in these patients' care, one of the hardest things is that we're consenting families exclusively over the phone because there are no family members in house. I was hoping that Dr. Turnbull could comment on some of the discussions with family that she's facilita sorry, facilitated as part of the ethics consult team. And then I was gonna ask Caitlin if she could talk about that as well as a bedside nurse there often our front line with the families and how that sort of changed how we are having these conversations and then caring for these patients. Sure. So um, I would say that the ethics, the clinical ethics service usually does not get involved in cases involving ECMO unless we are consulted by a member of the clinical team, usually when they believe that continuing ECMO is no longer likely to be medically effective. That's usually what initiates an ethics consult. Um, and the very first thing uh, we tend to do is try and get everybody who's been involved in the patient's care together because it is such a complex procedure and involves a lot of experts from different teams. And often um, a lot can be solved by just getting everybody in the same room and on the same page. Um, if there is then agreement across teams, including from um, a multidisciplinary perspective that continuing ECMO is not likely to be medically effective, and what I mean by that is, is unlikely to help achieve the patient's goal. Um, then we think about how best that needs to be communicated to the family. So a couple of things that I think about when we're talking to a team about whether they believe continuing ECMO would be medically ineffective. Um, the first is, would anything be different for a different patient? So. Uh, if this patient were, you know, uh, a different gender, a different race, of a different income level from a different country, do I think anything here would be different? Because those are factors that shouldn't be influencing decisions about treatment. The second thing I tend to worry about is whether there are members of the clinical team who don't feel heard or who feel that they're being asked to provide some kind of a care that is not aligned with their values or um, whether they might have uh, some kind of conscientious objection. So we try to make sure that everybody on the team gets a chance to speak about what they think they've heard. Um, then in terms of the family, it's essential to, when speaking with the family, assess um, what they've been told, what they understand, and uh, particularly what they understand about the likely outcomes of continuing treatment. So there's a big difference between a family who does not know that the clinical team does not expect their loved one to ever get well enough to come off ECMO uh, versus a family who knows that that's the expectation and wants to continue. So um, I think it's important to state that while, you know, Dr. Whitman said at the beginning that many of these patients don't have capacity to participate in decisions about initiating ECMO, um, we actually have been involved in a number of cases or at least a couple where the patient themselves was awake, conscious, able to communicate, and looks kind of deceptively well while they're getting ECMO. And that's really hard because um, if that patient has capacity, somebody needs to have a direct and honest conversation with them 
that while they may be alive on ECMO, we don't think that the additional time provided by being on ECMO is ever going to allow their organs to return to their baseline function or be well enough to survive without it. And obviously that's a devastating thing to have to say. That kind of news being broken is really hard. So thinking about, has that been communicated? It not, if not, who's gonna do it? Um, and then thinking about what kind of additional supports both the clinical team, the patient, and the family will need to, um, to get through this really devastating event because it's hard on everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Trumbull. Caitlin, can you comment on that from the nursing perspective? I know that you often have very close relationships with these patients when you've taken care of them for many weeks. Sure, so you know we've talked a lot about how decisions are made to put patients on ECMO. Um, and I think kind of Dr. Turnbull alluded to decisions that have to be made to take the patient off ECMO as well, um, which I think is more what the bedside nurse um, might be involved with and have difficulties with. Um, so it can be very challenging when you get to know these patients, especially when they are, you know, deceivingly well, like Dr. Turnbull said, um, kind of awake and able to communicate with you. And it can be just as difficult when the patient isn't able to communicate and you're trying to get a good estimate of what their wishes are and where they would um, want to see their life and what their kind of goals of care are as far as recovery. Um, so this can definitely be challenging, especially when you're working with these patients for multiple weeks and you're getting to know them and getting to know their families. I think the COVID era is presenting a new challenge in that we don't have families at the bedside. Um, and from my experience, it's very difficult to kind of get across to a family member what exactly is going on in the room without them seeing it firsthand. Um, so I think that's been kind of a new challenge that we're dealing with. You know, when families can come in and see the bedside and see this big machine and kind of everything going on with the patient, it's easier for them to kind of come to terms with um, the things that we might be telling them, even if it's really difficult things to hear. Um, but when, you know, we're using phone conversations and video conferences, you know, very grateful that we have those resources, but it's, it's not the same. Um, and I think it's very difficult to explain to family the extent of what's going on with their loved one. Um, and then on top of that, you have many patients that aren't able to communicate um, their wishes. And unfortunately may not have had an opportunity to communicate these wishes before they got intubated or went on ECMO. Um, so yeah, it's, it can definitely be challenging. And I think from a nursing perspective, we're the ones at the bedside kind of all the time for 12 hours straight, multiple days in a row. And then you have a few days off, you come back and you just want to know exactly what's going on with that patient because you get to know them so well. Um, it can be definitely challenging when your personal values or um, opinions conflict with what you know you see actually happening with the patient's plan. And that can be just from you know, maybe you would do something different with your family member than the family member is choosing to do with their loved one. Um, and it's, so it's kind of hard to put that aside sometimes and remember we're just looking for what's best for the patient's values um, and their wishes, but that can definitely create some, you know, internal moral distress as well. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I think there are a couple questions uh, to address. One is, asking specifically about the triage principles that guide the ELSO triage guidelines um, and whether or not they're different from the American Thoracic Society and other critical care society guidelines for allocating the last ventilator. So specifically, um, whether or not healthcare workers would be given preferential treatment to receive the last ECMO. Um, and then there's another question asking about the practicalities of reallocating ECMO from one patient to another and how involved and time consuming that would be in addition to preparing a machine. Maybe Dr. Kim, you could comment on some of those issues. I have, um, in reference to the allocation that's different from the ATS, um, you know, shortage of, of ventilators versus shortage of ECMO. Uh, the preferential treatment for healthcare providers, luckily we have not encountered this per se. We did get one call for a consult uh, for a healthcare provider, but we would still uh, need the person to fit our criteria for cannulation. Now, if they fell under, uh, you know, very 
if they were a little bit over on certain criteria, then maybe we would uh, be a little bit more lax just because this, this is a healthcare provider to someone on the front lines trying to help others. And so, of course, uh, without, uh, without having the, uh, the clear cut evidence saying that, you know, an absolute cutoff of seven days on a ventilator, I can't go beyond that. You know, these are kind of uh, guidelines and recommendations. So we would, uh, we would be a little bit more soft on, on, some, of the, uh, on some of those parameters. But um, as far as you know, making our criteria a little bit stricter as our resources have, have become uh, or become more scarce, we have also not uh, done this as far as uh, uh, here at Hopkins. Um, we have not run out of, again, as Dr. Bush had said, we have not run out of um, uh, circuits. It's more of a day-to-day -day allocation of, uh, of ICU beds and nursing. So that has not been an issue. And, and so we have not had to make our criteria any more stricter uh, as we go forward. Uh, whether that changes, uh, you know, is yet to be seen, but really it's come at, our numbers have come down a little bit rather than um, seeing another surge. Dr. Whitman or Dr. Bush, do you have anything to add to that as far as the guidelines and decannulating? Um, maybe it's telling that although I've read the guidelines from everywhere, I could not tell you how our triage plan and our guidelines are for any given line the same or different from what ELSO or the American Thoracic Society is, is um, advocating. I, I actually can't quote them. Um, but when we came up with our triage plan led by Alan Kachalia from the Armstrong Institute, um, we did go over all of these indications and contraindications and we came up with a document that we thought expressed um, justice for all, we never wanted to get in a situation where we had to turn a patient down who was going to die if not being placed on ECMO as a result of lack of resources. That was always a problem. And as Errol said, we initially worried that we wouldn't have enough circuits. We thought the number of circuits was going to be limiting. Believe it or not, in, when, when we worked with pediatrics and uh, perfusion, we came up with the ability to put 20 people on ECMO when we initially thought it was going to be six or seven. What we did not recognize was we actually are stuck at seven, eight, or nine because we don't have the, the beds or nursing that can staff more than that for any significant period of time. While this was all going on at the, in the beginning of March, all of the ECMO capable hospitals in the middle, in Maryland, Washington, and Virginia got on the phone together every, started getting on the phone together every Wednesday. We still do. Um, and we discuss what our capacity is, whether we can take a transfer, um, what we think of this kind of person or that kind of person and, and, and what problems we're coming up with and sharing stories and they're all anecdotes, um, but also sharing capacity so that would anybody, should anybody get into trouble, we, we know what hospital could take this patient as a transfer and we haven't all been full. Some of the hospitals have been full and they have transferred patients, but none of us have, we haven't all been full at the same time and so we've never had to make that, that kind of Sophie's choice. Well, if you haven't read Sophie's choice, then that won't be helpful. But the, the, we haven't had to make a decision between two living human beings as to who, who gets therapy. And I wanna say one more thing. When we all sat down um, with Alan Kachaya leading the group and we, and we sat down with, um, University of Maryland and us and thinkers, our decision was that if someone was on ECMO and had a survival chance and we had no more resources available and someone needed ECMO, 
without which they were going to die. No one who had a chance of survival on ECMO would be taken off ECMO for the reason that the person who needed ECMO might have a better chance. If the sense was, if you have any chance, you stay on ECMO and then it becomes a first come first serve. You were on ECMO first, you get to stay on ECMO. But thank God we haven't had to do this. Thank you, Dr. Whitman. I think that it would be great since we have Caitlin here today to talk about the ethical resiliency team um, because I know this has been a very difficult time for everyone taking care of these patients and I, I think it would be great to talk about the resources that we have here at Hopkins for that. Sure, I'd be happy to um, touch on that. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons that healthcare workers are probably experiencing high levels of stress right now. Um, and especially, I think, healthcare workers taking care of COVID patients, and especially on the ECMO machines, like we've talked about, all the ethical issues that can arise from that. Um, and then families not being at the bedside, I think it just leaves a lot of um, burden on the bedside team, the providers, the nurses, perfusion, et cetera. Um, facilitating conversations over the phone that are difficult to have and kind of being the only support at the bedside with the patient since families aren't able to be there. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about a few different resources that staff has for moral distress. So moral, um, we have the MEPRA team. So Dr. Cinda Russian and her team, she's on the panel now, created a um, um, Mindful Ethical Practice and Resiliency Academy, you know, years years ago before the COVID era even happened to train bedside nurses in ethical conflict management, facilitating ethical conversations um, with coworkers and also uh, building personal resiliency. So at this point, um, a couple years after that was initiated, there's multiple MEPRA champions as we call them and also just MEPRA graduates around the hospital. Uh, most of the MEPRA champions are in um, the ICUs, the NCC, the CVCU and um, the SICU. So as member champions, um, we're bedside nurses that are, again, special, specialty trained in facilitating moral conversations. So I think that's always a good place to start if you're having uh, moral distress is to reach out to your team on your unit, especially a member graduate or a member champion. Um, if it's something that, you know, the whole team is experiencing ethical distress from or if there seems to be some sort of ethical conflict, um, an ethical ethics consult, excuse me, can be placed and that can be placed by any member of the team. And I think Dr. Turnbull could, was going to speak more about um, the ethics consults themselves. Alternately, there's the RISE team, and RISE stands for Resiliency in Stressful Events. And that's an emotional um, peer support group responsible for attending to secondhand victims um, impacted by stressful patient events. So again, these are all resources that have been available besides COVID, before the COVID era, um, but that could be extremely helpful during this time. Um, the RICE team can be reached on Chorus, and I do believe they're doing um, Zoom conferences as well, since we can't necessarily always meet in person. Um, that's especially helpful for, you know, after the conclusion of a stressful event. So say the patient passes away and there's a lot of ethical feelings, um, the staff members are feeling very distressed after the event. That can be very helpful. Um, and then lastly, there's my support, which is relatively new, I think, in the last year or two that Hopkins has developed. Um, it's a free confidential employee counseling service. So information about that is on the intranet. Um, they can be reached by phone or um, by signing up online. And then other uh, resources just to build personal resiliency during this time. Hopkins is offering free access to the Calm app. It's an app for your phone um, that offers mindfulness and meditation practices. So that's also another good resources. Um, so yeah, I think we're all just kind of looking to support each other during this time. I think as first-hand responders, things can be very stressful. Um, so my biggest thing would just be use your resources um, and then speak up to coworkers if you're feeling any sort of distress. Usually if you're feeling something, someone else is too. So, you know, working as a team to resolve these issues is always a good, a good answer. Brandy, could I interject something? I would love that, Dr. Whitman. The world is not ready for ECMO and those of us who use it recognize this on a daily basis. No one is taught that there's the possibility that you can be alive on a machine 
but will be dead almost within minutes if you're off it. And that while you're on that machine, your brain functions normally, you can watch TV, you can laugh, you can talk with your family, but if that machine stops, you're dead. And no one has been given the social education as in high school or primary school or college, or I don't care where, that is not part of the educational curriculum to have members of our society talk about this and, and come up with some strategies for dealing with it, let alone the person does have mental faculties, uh, it, but isn't quite aware of their surroundings. And now the family members have to say, this is futile care. They have to recognize this is futile care. They've never even been involved with anything that looks like this. And we're talking to them about making the decision of withdrawing care when their loved one is absolutely alive on this machine. It is unbelievable to watch the consternation that goes on in families, as well as the lack of understanding that goes on with families in, term, in terms of what the magnitude of what they're dealing with. And, and we as healthcare workers, but particularly the bedside nurses, are dealing with this constantly. But it has got to become part of our society's education, like advanced care directives, that people now recognize um, it's almost impossible to die in some situations, even if there's no way of living. Thank you, Dr. Whitman. I think, you know, that's been one of the most humbling and difficult parts for the fellows as well as having these conversations and even just trying to explain what ECMO is, you know, is a pretty long process and, and difficult, very difficult to do. Um, we were hoping to talk a little bit about the shared decision-making model in the ICU. I'm wondering if Dr. Kim can maybe comment a little bit too about when we're having these discussions and bringing up with the family that this is really a shared decision-making model and how we approach that conversation. Sure. Um, I think just going back to what uh, Dr. Whitman was saying, it's really important to start right at the consent process and explain, oh, really try our best to explain what to expect with uh, the patient or their, uh, their loved one being on the ECMO support. Uh, but it is really impossible for them to really know what to expect. And by the time we get to this uh, period of futility of care, uh, and we try to help them recognize this futility, uh, it's, it, it becomes extremely difficult. And I applaud uh, Dr. Bush's efforts of explaining to family members and really kind of uh, right at the beginning telling them that it's gonna be a week to week process, uh, that if we don't see any improvements, there's a very good chance that uh, the patient will have to come off ECMO support. And they almost invariably all agree, but again, uh, you know, one month down the road, uh, it's hard to know how everyone's going to react. Um, but as far as this uh, team approach, uh, we do our best. And, and again, the COVID era is, is a, a new challenge upon itself, but we do try to incorporate families in Zoom meetings and have them see the loved ones on, on the mach machines, the mechanical ventilator, as well as the ECMO support, and have as, as often uh, as we need to, these meetings to have all the healthcare providers, palliative care involved very early on, uh, as well as the bedside nurses. And we tried to come up with the best solution that would work, work for everyone. But again, it's, it's not easy and it's, uh, it's very, very challenging. Dr. Bush, do you have any thoughts to add? We're approaching uh, the four minute mark here, but having led so many of these conversations, any takeaways for you, either overall or from the COVID era specifically? Hey, you know, um, I think um, I've had the conversation a lot, so I uh, try to um, make sure I say the same thing each time to, to give a consistent message. But I think, as you alluded to earlier, in the COVID era, it's been um, more challenging because usually the family's not there. Um, and then especially, um, I don't know, maybe half of our population has been um, non-English speaking uh, or maybe 
40 percent or so but um so i think that also makes it uh, a little difficult you're calling people in the middle of the night um they have no idea who you are and you have to use a translator and try to convey this complex operational procedure that you're proposing and ask and asking them if they agree and as dr kim said they invariably decide to proceed most of the time, but I don't think they have a real understanding. And the challenge is really that you don't have all the family members around as we would usually do before this era, um, so that everybody kind of hears what the process is going to be. Because I think now when you just talk to one person, that person agrees, but three, four weeks later when you're in a situation where you need to withdraw, and now the family is hearing this discussion for the first time, then usually that one person you spoke to is okay with, um, with withdrawal, but then the other family members um, do not have that understanding and then they want to continue. So I, I think it's more challenging now um, to have a family understand what's really going on. Thank you, Dr. Bush. Does anyone on the panel have any final thoughts they'd like to add? I really appreciate everyone's time doing this. This has been a very time intensive and labor intensive, uh, you know, service that everyone has been providing and, you know, it's very much appreciated. And any further audience questions to Suzanne, if you could let me know. So I just want to thank our panel for um, <clears throat> bringing this really important issue into our community dialogue, because I, I think these are the questions that a lot of people are struggling with. And so I really want to thank every one of our panelists for their very important perspectives. We mentioned moral resilience rounds, um, and here's some more information about it, should that be something that would benefit you or your colleagues. Um, it's really a time not necessarily to give answers, but to, to actually explore the kinds of things that, that um, the residue of the moral challenges that we are experiencing. So we invite you to join us um, on Thursdays from 12 to 1. And thank you all for being here and for your incredible commitment to our patients and to our colleagues. Brandy, I had no idea what to expect when this hour started, but I just want to applaud you. I think you did a spectacular job um, as the moderator and putting this all together. Together, I, I think it's super important for people to understand this new technology. And I, I think the, uh, the panelists uh, uh, all, I'm speaking for them, but I think we enjoyed it. And, and the way you ran this was really well done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whitman. I will send out a summary of um, this session and it was recorded so it can be accessed um, by anyone for all perpetuity. So thank you again for participating. Great job, thanks.